you know, the, the technologies we have now were really introduced, the fundamental technologies were introduced in the 1960s. That's when the birth control pill was first approved by the FDA. And that mechanism of action, meaning using synthetic hormones to suppress ovulation, has really been the fundamental way in which um, products have worked over the last 60 years. This is Stasia. So my name is Stacia Obramski. I'm a managing director of RIA Ventures. Rhea and RIA is a social venture firm that invests in reproductive health, including contraception. Specifically, they invest in new forms of contraception for women that are different than what's out there and what's been made before. They're looking to create new forms of birth control that diversify the line of products out there, bring something new to the table. Over the last six years, there's been a lot of innovation in how those hormones get delivered. You can get them by injection, by implant, by pill. Um, there really has not been any uh, innovation in terms of looking at hormone-free methods or much innovation looking at um, male methods. So here we are. It's been 60 years since the female pill, and we've been working on a version of the pill for men even longer than that. We've got iPhones, we've got self-driving cars, and we've got all these things that have been lauded as the future, like sci-fi from the 1950s has become reality in so many ways. And we've seen advancement in contraception, but it's mostly been in the form of repackaging, the same active part, the drug that has a contraceptive effect. It's been put into pills and IUDs and implants and injectables that all mostly work the same way. This has given people products that have all sorts of different characteristics, and it's a great way to offer people options in a space where they really need options, but it's not the same sort of sci-fi advancement that we've seen in other technologies. And to really hammer this point home, we haven't had any new male contraceptive options. Zero. Nada. None. Why haven't we been able to make something new? Something better? Something for men? I think there are two reasons. I think there's a biological reason and I think there's a culture reason. Um, the biological reason is obviously that women disproportionately bear the burden of uh, an unintended pregnancy, um, both physical burden and then ultimately, um, you know, the responsibility for caring for that, uh, that child. So, um, and that really, I think, has dominated so much of the perception and, and the research efforts uh, until recently. The reason we don't have male contraception right now is lots of reasons. Some of them are scientific. Overcoming the biological hurdles is rough, and men make a few million sperm a day, and contraceptives have got to stop essentially all of them. Some of the reasons are financial, like how a drug can take a billion dollars to get to market, and drug companies haven't put that money into contraception. And then there are some reasons that are a little harder to understand, and potentially rooted in a long history of bias and discrimination. Male contraception is a complicated subject. There's all this weird biology and social factors, and the big thing that nobody's done this before. So that's why we want to think forward. What sort of hurdles are going to come up in the future? What new challenges might present themselves right now and later on in getting male contraception to market? In a previous episode, we talked about getting to clinical trials and how so many male contraceptive projects are hyper-focused on that one piece testing your product, your drug, your device, whatever, in people. But getting into clinical trials will only get you a pat on the back. Unless you want to end up like so many failed male contraceptives, you have to think ahead. Think about the problems that aren't here yet, because once they hit, they don't wait. And stalled projects quickly become dead projects. So that's what we're covering today. Challenges. Specifically, the challenges of getting male birth control to market, and to the public. Because really, what does it take to make a new drug? We'll cover the hurdles that male contraceptives are going to face in development, in the clinic, and beyond, because in every challenge lies an opportunity, and the hard part is yet to come. Stay tuned. From Male Contraceptive Initiative, this is Intended. I'm Logan Nichols. And I'm Kevin Shane. Intended is brought to you in part by YTH, an initiative of ETR. YTH is a nonprofit that advances the health of youth and young adults through technology. YTH Live 2020 will be a dynamic virtual conference held August 3rd through 5th, 2020. In its 12th year, YTH Live will center youth and technology and technology's impact on youth health. YTH Live 2020 will focus on the overall health and wellness of key populations and how innovative technology can be used to improve health outcomes. 
YTH Live will showcase the brightest minds and cutting edge research in topics ranging from sexual and reproductive health to mental health, digital rights, and climate change. As a technology-based conference, they're excited to model how virtual platforms can provide engaging opportunities for participants to share, network, and innovate. To learn more about this virtual conference, visit YTH.org. Again, that's YTH.org. Okay, this is Intended, where we tell you why, in a world where half of all pregnancies are unintended, men still only have condoms and vasectomies. I'm Logan Nichols. So in our last episode, we talked about science and the people who do science kind of at the same time. Both of them usually start in academia and they explore and they branch out. And then as the scientist learns more and the thing that's going to become a drug starts getting developed, they both get a little more focused. The science and the researchers sometimes move out of academia and into a business. And the thing that everybody gets focused on is developing that drug, getting it all the way to the market. Getting a drug to market takes an enormous amount of effort for any therapeutic area much less something semi-niche like male contraception. And a lot of the male contraceptive projects in development right now are in that early stage, academic exploration. There, researchers are studying a drug target, the link in the biological chain that when you disrupt it, you get a guy that's temporarily infertile. With a drug, that means continuing to take the drug if you want to make sure that link stays broken, or if you want to restore it, you stop taking the drug. But getting from a drug target to a drug is really where the hard part begins. Finding the right drug requires bringing together the worlds of chemistry and biology, toxicology, pharmacology, clinical science, all in this one cohesive way that can create a molecule, a chemical entity, or a drug that's safe and effective. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Shane, who can walk you through some of that process. The world of drug development has been called expensive, difficult, and inefficient. It requires a ton of time, effort, and capital in order to get even a single drug out there. And why is it so hard? Well, there are a lot of reasons. And most of them lie around the fact that when you're developing a drug, you can't just go and toss it into a person to see how well it works. Instead of that, researchers use analogous systems. Models. These models are sometimes in animals, or sometimes on a lab bench, and they're supposed to be a representation of the real thing. Of people. If you've got a bunch of cells in a petri dish, it's a lot easier, and more ethical, to test new things over and over on them as opposed to in a person. These systems are intended to show as close as we can real 100% proof that the drug will be safe and effective when it eventually does get into a person. And that makes sense. We can't just develop a drug and test it in a person without conducting our due diligence, because, well, that's not exactly going to keep people safe. On top of that, it would be a waste of money. Getting that far is expensive, so a developer had better be sure that things are going to work out if they're going to get all the way into human trials. And these models also serve other purposes. You never land on the right drug the first time. Well, almost never. Researchers nearly always have to iterate and test different versions of a drug to find one that's potent enough or safe enough or meets the thousand other criteria a drug needs to be successful. For example, drugs don't just go into the body, find their target, and work. There's a whole slew of chemical and biological interactions that play into how drugs get to where they're going and interact with their environment. Like solubility. Drugs have to be able to dissolve in both water and fat, because most of the body is water, but cells are surrounded by a membrane with lots of fat molecules. And drugs generally have to penetrate this membrane to get to where they're going. The drug has to be the right size too big, and it generally has a hard time getting through all the nooks and crannies and into the cell, or it can also be degraded by the body. And to complicate things, you can't just design a drug that gets into cells. It also has to work. When drugs get into the cell, they need to fit their target really well, like be the exact right key that fits into the exact right lock so that you need less of the drug overall to have an effect. And designing a drug that fulfills all these criteria is a big game of guess and check. Well, sometimes it's more educated guess and check, but there's no prescribed process. Every drug and every drug target is difficult in their own way, and it takes lots of experience and years of work to do it well. However, once you've got a good drug and proven all the things you need to prove using these analogous models, it still has to get into people, and the focus is entirely on safety. 
Yeah. So, so first and foremost is really establishing, you know, the the safety of the drug uh, in whatever mode it's going to be delivered, and and that is kind of a foundational need, regardless of what you're developing and what indication is really um, establishing that safety profile, you know, in healthy men um, of of that method. This is Sabrina. So Sabrina Marchucci Johnson, I'm the founder and the CEO of Dare Bioscience. Dare is a small pharma company with a portfolio of products that focus on innovation in women's health. Which in our view does include uh, male methods of contraception since that certainly would uh, enhance options for women. (laughs) Their projects include sexual and reproductive health and have a focus on contraception. One project is a partnership with Bayer, testing a hormone-free contraceptive for women. Dare is also interested in male methods of birth control and what regulatory authorities like the Food and Drug Administration might need from a new male method. Because we don't really know yet. Men don't have any direct health risks from pregnancy, only women. And that means that once male methods of birth control get into clinical trials, we'll need to decide what safe really means. So that definitely represents an extra hurdle for sure. With women, at least, there are medical risks associated with pregnancy. <laughs> and, um, and so by helping a woman not become pregnant, you are actually helping her to mitigate um, certain potential medical risks. Whereas in the male, there is no health, potential health benefit to him directly um, by taking the contraceptive method. And so that do no harm mandate is going to be very, very important. You know, do no harm, that guiding principle of medical ethics. And it's intended to make sure that the health of the patient is always at the forefront and why there's all this concern about safety in drug development. You want to make sure that any intervention, any treatment is in the best interest of the patient. So women, they get pregnant, which is a health risk in and of itself. And since contraception mitigates that health risk, birth control is considered ethical, even if it has a minor health risk associated with it. But men don't get pregnant, and that means we really don't know where the FDA will set the bar with regards to safety. And that makes setting up a clinical trial for a male birth control pill risky. I mean, that's what clinical trials are designed to figure out. Is this in the best interest of the patient? Is this safe? Clinical trials are generally segmented into three phases. Phase one is really focused on being the first test in humans. This is where they really scrutinize the safety of the drug and hone in on the right dose, how much of the drug to give someone so that the risks are minimized, but it still does what you want it to do. The second phase is generally testing that dose for actual effectiveness, making sure that the drug does what you claim it'll do and that the dose you're giving people is still very safe. The FDA is all about claims. If you claim your drug does something, you've got to prove that claim completely and thoroughly. Like with science and evidence and a whole lot of people saying, yes, this is definitive proof. You know how sometimes you see that statement on commercials for dietary supplements? These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. It usually goes along with, This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. That's actually a specific thing they have to say. They can't claim that taking stuff like ginkgo biloba is going to cure Alzheimer's. They can only say that, oh, it increases blood flow and can help your memory, stuff that's vague and doesn't treat any specific condition. But if you want to make a drug and say, yes, this will prevent you from getting pregnant, it's a whole different ballgame. You're making a claim here. If you take this drug, this specific health measure will happen in this specific way. And that means you have to prove it. Phase three is where that happens. It's where the rubber meets the road and a big cohort gets tested to really make sure that what was seen in the previous trials is consistent. And if there's a variability across a population, completion of phase three trials is what actually gets a drug to market lets it be approved by the FDA. But what are they actually testing in clinical trials? Like, how do they come to the conclusion, yes, this drug works to prevent pregnancy? Especially when we think about a male method of contraception, one where there isn't a precedent. You know, our guess, and it really is just that right now, a guess, 
is that what will be required would be very, very analogous to what is currently required for any new contraceptive method that is undergoing, um, you know, clinical development and, and clinical evaluation, which is, you know, demonstrating its ability to um, prevent pregnancies. And this is really the crux of the matter. Contraception, no matter if it's delivered in men or women, is supposed to prevent pregnancy, something that takes both men and women together. And so that means that, as far as we know now, clinical trials will have to monitor how many women get pregnant in a study. That's going to be how they determine if a male birth control is effective or not. And that means that men and women alike will have to be enrolled in the study. Men who are taking the drug and their partners who are the ones at risk of getting pregnant. And, you know, the FDA has very clear guidance on what they require for female methods, but in the end, that endpoint is still the same. So even if you're developing a male method, while there might be some additional safety uh, data that has to be generated depending on how the product works and in terms of its long-term effects in men, from an effectiveness perspective, you know, we would expect that the agency would just be looking for the same things we're looking for today is what proportion of women um, become pregnant Um, when their partner is using that product. But if we're looking at pregnancy, how long do we have to test this drug before we're sure that it's the reason people aren't getting pregnant? I mean, lots of people can have a hard time getting pregnant, even when they're trying to. Um, So you're required to look at thousands of cycles, (laughs) Um, like 10,000 cycles. And by cycles, Sabrina means menstrual cycles, the repeating pattern of hormone changes in women that enable ovulation, and subsequently, pregnancy. So that ends up equating typically into, you know, 2,000 women or so um, over a course of 13 cycles. So that's typically the, the path that pe- people take. Obviously, you can get to number of cycles with fewer women in longer time or more women in less time. But typically, from a safety perspective as well, you often need to have at least 12 months. And that typically comes in two trials. So it's not necessarily... Um, you know, all in one study, the FDA typically requires two phase three trials for um, a regulatory approval. And so typically those women, you know, those 2,000 or so subjects are often broken up into two different studies. There are also examples of female methods that take a lot more than that. Methods with different characteristics or new modes of action, so on and so forth. Those can take more participants, which, of course, means more money. And these trials are expensive in the best case scenario. I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars expensive. On top of that, they take years and years. And that's for female methods of birth control, where there's a precedent and a standard. Male methods don't have that, which means there's risk to consider in both development as well as regulatory. And that can make developers like Sabrina a little wary of spending all the capital to bring a drug up from scratch. The good news is there are some ways to mitigate that. So um, one is to, you know, try to focus on drugs that have already been approved for other indications and are well understood and uh, or targets that are well understood, uh, because then even though you are now going to be giving him something for um, a condition that doesn't have a health consequence for him, you are at least doing so with a drug that is very well understood. Um, the other is to try to find ways to minimize the systemic um, uptake of whatever you're delivering. So anything that can Systemic treatment is something like a pill, where the drug dissolves and gets distributed through the body. That means that the drug has the ability to spread to every tissue in the body, and that gives more opportunity for side effects. Because it's going not just where you want it, but everywhere else too. But some ways of delivering a drug, or using a drug-device combination, make it to where the drug has a much higher concentration in one part of the body, the place where you want it. Um, And the other approach that one can take is thinking a little bit outside the box and thinking first about how some of these targets that are affecting sperm motility, for instance, how they might be able to be administered first um, to women. 
And right, because then at least you've you've started that regulatory process in a population where there's already a roadmap of how to get a contraceptive product approved, where there's already clearly some tolerance on the part of the FDA for some risk profile and some side effect profile um, for her to experience and start there so that you actually collect more information about the product, get it approved in that population first before you take it into, you know, an approval process in men. And and that is a little bit different thinking because I know people are very excited as they should be about getting a male contraceptive method approved you know, first and foremost in men, and that definitely is the end goal game. But from a regulatory perspective, if you start potentially in a population where there's already a roadmap on how to get a contraceptive product approved, um, in, including methods that are not necessarily systemic or um, have different targets, then, you know, you can utilize that as a means of actually collecting some very important human data to then help support your male program as well. Sabrina, along with all the other folks in the field, is looking for ways to do this thing with less risk. To do it faster, cheaper, better. Because doing it the long way here, developing a drug from the ground up, is harder, slower, and costly. The big pharma companies, they're the ones with the resources and heft to absorb risk like this, and they're not interested. And for other, smaller developers, it will still be a risky, expensive road, even if someone can find a shortcut. And that's because the challenges don't end when a drug gets approved by regulatory agencies. You've still got to think about things like manufacturing, distribution, marketing. Things that are all very much part of the process, but very different from the biology we've been doing. On top of that, even if we do something on the cheap, find a shortcut, it's still not actually cheap. More on that, coming up after the break. Support for Intended is provided by Male Contraceptive Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit that advances the research and development of new methods of male contraception. We promote male contraception with scientific granting, advocacy, and outreach in order to bring about an inclusive landscape of contraception to people around the world. More information is available at malecontraceptive.org, where you can find our grants, our frequently asked questions, and understand what the future of contraception could be. That's malecontraceptive.org. Welcome back to Intended. I'm your host, Logan Nichols. Making male birth control is inherently a scientific process. You gotta build a drug and test it and prove to the authorities that it's safe and it works. But it's also a business, and that process takes a lot of capital. So who pays for it? Where does the capital come from? Especially in the world of male contraception, where Big Pharma isn't interested. MCI's executive director, Heather Vidot, has the story. Let's start with just an understanding of of how any scientific innovation gets to market. Um, That's Stajo Bremsky again, from the top of the show. I'm a managing director of RIA Ventures. And remember, she's part of RIA, a social venture firm that invests in women's reproductive health, including contraception. And her view of scientific funding goes all the way back to the public, the taxpayer. So... You know, a a lot of basic science is funded by government grant dollars. So our taxpayer dollars goes into the NIH, which gives out um, research grants to to scientists who are really discovering novel um, compounds and uh, new ways of thinking about science. And those discoveries then are typically can be picked up in, in one of two ways. They can be picked up by industry where those those innovation discoveries get licensed out to a pharmaceutical company who is interested in doing the product development work, the commercialization work, and ultimately bringing that product to market. Or they often get spun out by sometimes the scientists themselves, and they get funded in in the commercial market. And by that, I mean with venture capital money or investors. Basically, at least in the United States, your tax dollars go towards basic science. Grants that are given out by big government agencies to learn more about our world in the hopes of making the population healthier and better. As that science grows and we find ways to use that knowledge to actually make the public healthier, 
private companies will often come in and buy that knowledge or product or process, whatever it is, in order to commercialize it and find a way to make money from it. And that movement of the project from one group to another, it often doesn't happen just once. Getting a drug to market is a long, complex process that requires lots of different parties with lots of expertise. This is like a long series of handoffs. And as the expertise changes, so do the people doing the funding. The same sort of handoff in the, um, in the capital uh, structure where NIH does the first set of funding. And then maybe you have a, an early biotech VC company, which does the second sa- stage of funding. And then maybe you have a, a strategic partner who comes in and do, does the third. Or you have the public market where the company goes public and uh, institutional investors fund that. So you have these parallel tracks where you have the capital path and you have the drug development path and they have to move together. This pathway is tried and true. In the spirit of capitalism, the government does its job of spurring innovation and then lets the private industry come in and run with the results, creating products, jobs, and profit. In the contraceptive space, unfortunately, what's happened is that that pathway has has broken, meaning that the drug companies no longer seem to be interested in bringing new products forward. So if there are discoveries in the lab, there's no one to hand that discovery off to. We've talked about this before. The majority of private industry doesn't seem to be interested in male methods of contraception. Or new kinds of contraception at all, really. That means that even if government agencies are given grants, and even if there are scientists doing work around contraception, nothing is going to make it to market if there isn't a route to commercialization. A pathway where someone picks up the technology and tries to move it forward. And why is that? Industry isn't there to hand that idea off to. And frankly, the commercial venture capital market thinks those ideas are still too risky. Risk. It's the motivating factor for a lot of decisions, especially when it comes to funding. How likely is it that a certain product is successful? What kind of situation are we in if it isn't successful? In a world where 90% of products fail even after they make it into clinical trials, Planning for failure and only promoting success is a self-preservation instinct. And lots of drug developers see male contraception as too risky still. Maybe they don't think they can make a drug that's safe enough. Or they're not sure they can make one that's effective enough. Or they don't know what those levels of safe and effective actually even need to be, so why bother starting if we don't know where the bar is? Or maybe even they don't think that there's a market, that men won't use a contraceptive no matter how safe and effective it is. And framing things like this, in self-preservation and caution and being risk-averse, it means that drug developers may not be seizing an opportunity. And they also, I don't think, have a good appreciation for the business case of why the contraceptive market, even though there are you know, products out there already, is still a market that I think is right for disruption. I mean, think about that for a second. A male method of contraception something totally different. It could change how people think about birth control, who takes it, what it's supposed to look like, how people talk about it, and more than that, it could disrupt the business of contraception. There are nearly 4 billion men in this world and none of them have products like the pill or like IUDs or like any other method out there. If we were to just bring one new method to the market? I think you would see a tremendous amount of economic value and potential being created there. So how do we de-risk? How do we show developers that there is a market and an opportunity for male methods of contraception? Staj's firm, RIA, sees themselves working in that space for female methods. Our investors are impact investors, so we care about both purpose and profit, mission and money. We believe strongly that uh, women's health has been underfunded and particularly reproductive health has been underfunded and that a good use of social capital is to come in and and be there in that gap between discovery of early uh, innovations and demonstration that this actually can work and can be developed into a product. The goal of many organizations is to, quote unquote, de-risk the development of contraceptive products. That includes venture capital like RIA, but also nonprofits, foundations, and government agencies like the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation, and us, Male Contraceptive Initiative. The strategy revolves around paying for the early, riskier stages of R&D 
to incentivize pharma to license and develop these products further on in the development process. So depending on the stage at which a product is picked up, some measure, be it demonstration of effectiveness or product safety or some similar indication of success will have been reached. That reduces the risk that dollars spent by pharma will be lost to a failed product. This is a great strategy to attract pharma back to the contraceptive space and seems like a great way to work towards more cost-effective contraceptive products. Unfortunately, it has been tried in the past with some less than ideal results. Development of some of the more modern, longer-acting contraceptive methods like implants in the hormonal IUD, or intrauterine system as it's known, was heavily subsidized by donor funding in the 80s and 90s. This approach did indeed bring pharma to the table to take on the licensing, manufacture, and distribution of these products. However, after the dust settled and the products actually hit the market, they were priced out of range for many international agencies working in developing countries who had contributed to their development. What's more, these products were priced in more economically developed countries at margins that far exceeded the cost to produce and market them, making it less likely that users could afford them or that insurers would cover them. To be clear, I'm not trying to paint Big Pharma as the bad guy here. They are, after all, a business, and they have to make big decisions in a world where a mistake could cost hundreds of millions of dollars. More than that, they're valuable partners, and attracting them to the space could push a new contraceptive over the finish line. But I'm wondering, if they don't see the writing on the wall, that there are new contraceptives coming and that these products can really upend what the contraceptive space looks like, why are researchers, the people taking the charge today, waiting for them to swoop in and save the day? For many, many years, they sort of sat back and said, well, I'll, I'll discover this and then I'll just give it to a pharmaceutical company. Well, there are no more pharmaceutical companies, so you got to have a plan B. And what is plan B? You're going to have to start a company like Your Choice Therapeutics or like Contraline. These are some startup biotech companies whereby uh, entrepreneurial scientists had great ideas in the labs that they realized if they wanted to see those ideas come to the market, they were going to have to put together a management team, raise some money, and go out and, and do the product development. The old model of capitalism doesn't apply in contraception right now. There's no big company there standing, waiting for the handoff of the next big, great discovery. And if a researcher wants to move something forward, it seems that now they're going to have to do some of the dirty work themselves create that pipeline of talent and expertise, then go out and find the pipeline of capital to make it happen. And this is outside of the wheelhouse of a lot of researchers. You're basically asking someone who's great at research and science to become a business person, develop a new skill set on the fly. And that means that community and collaboration are more important than ever. Building a world where funding agencies, developers, regulators, and everyone else come together to form our own collective. Because if we don't do it, there's no guarantee anyone else will. But who knows? Big Pharma might just be there to swoop in after all. They might be waiting in the wings for one of those projects to get de-risked just enough that they think it's worth it. Standing in the shadows, ready to pounce when they think the time is right. I would just say I am aware that even though Big Pharma isn't um, playing, they are watching. Um, And they are very aware of who's doing what and, and w- what progress they're making, and um, they're curious. Coming up on Intended, we'll go through one more challenge facing male contraception, and it happens all the way after a drug is made, approved, and is out there for the world. Marketing. How to sell male birth control. After the break. Support for Intended is provided by Male Contraceptive Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit that advances the research and development of male contraceptive methods. We foster a scientific community, and we bring researchers from all fields and walks of life to study male contraception, from market research all the way to bench science. If there are ways to specifically interfere with sperm mitochondria um, and therefore change their activity, uh, drain them of energy to swim, or cause them to not be able to penetrate the egg's outer layers. Um, so, yeah, we are, we're investigating a few compounds. That can... For more information on MCI and how we're supporting the future of male contraception, head over to malecontraceptive.org. Again, that's malecontraceptive.org.
Okay, welcome back to Intended. I'm Logan Nichols, and we've been talking about challenges facing male contraception. Challenges that are coming, and we see them in the windshield as we speed toward them. Things like clinical trials and regulatory agencies, and, of course, funding. But there's another thing that's going to come up after all of that. Because getting a drug out and onto the market isn't the end of the story. After that, there's the biggest unknown of all. How we get men excited about it. I'm talking about marketing and advertising and all that. The United States is an outlier when it comes to drugs and how they're marketed. We're one of two countries that allow direct-to-consumer advertising for pharmaceuticals. And that means that when these products get out there and into the world, they're going to have to appeal to the average consumer. But the average consumer for male contraceptives might be anyone. Well, anyone that produces sperm, is sexually active, and wants to prevent pregnancy. But that's a really big bubble. According to one of our studies, that makes a market of over 17 million men in the United States alone. And within that are single guys that want to protect themselves, and guys that want something beyond condoms and vasectomy, and then guys that are in relationships that just want better options, something that gives them and their partner anything else. All these guys have different motivations and desires, and more than that, they'll need to be engaged, spoken to directly to get them into a topic like this, a topic that hasn't engaged them as long as they've been alive. And even though half of all men are interested in male contraceptives, there's a gap between interest and use. We're going to have to get regular men, your average Joe, to know about male contraception, to like male contraception, and to use male contraception. And can I break the fourth wall for a second here and be real with you? I hate the term male contraception. Not the concept, but the words coming out of my mouth. It's clunky, it's difficult to say, and more than that, I think it's kind of an isolating term. And like, male contraception. Try saying that into a microphone a few dozen times an episode. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. The clunkiness isn't just in moving your mouth and making the words either. It's a phrase that doesn't have a cool factor. It's an unbrandable image. The fact that it has five syllables, which, side note, is two more than it should be, make it to where it's hard to see it on packaging or commercial or integrating into the conversation of the world. Think about the pill. For better or for worse, that's a brand. Something that you know what it is the moment you hear it. And the words are punchy. The pill. Sure, it's gotten this moniker and brand because of how revolutionary it was, but male contraception? Maybe for the reason that it's clunky or squishy? It doesn't really evoke anything specific in my mind. And I don't know how to make it cool. How we brand this thing we're trying to do. Do we call it something goofy, like sperm stoppers? Do we approach it empathetically and do like collaborative contraception? Or do we code it and we hide it in acronyms and obscure drug company lingo? Of course, one of the reasons the pill is called the pill because of the historical need to be discreet, to speak in coded words. You didn't want people to know you were on the pill. Sex was for making babies, not for pleasure. Male contraceptives aren't going to need the same discretion for lots of historical and gendered reasons, but I also don't think we're ready to shout at passing cars that, hey, I'm a dude and I'm on birth control. And that's another thing. The status quo leaves men out of family planning. Contraception right now doesn't really speak to men much, and calling it male contraception is kind of the, oh, okay, you may now enter this space. It signifies that men aren't welcome in the world until these products hit, and until they do, men should just stay on the sidelines. And that's not really the way I want to think about this. Male contraception should just be contraception, with no modifiers needed, because this is really an issue for people to work out together. There should be inclusion and communication and education for men and women alike. Having that prefix of male or female contraception immediately others the, well, other side by setting it apart instead of thinking about the whole. Think about it this way. Male contraception is intrinsically part of female contraception. Men will be taking contraception to prevent pregnancy in their partners, and thus women are an inseparable part of the equation. And just the fact that we're talking about the male pill so often, it burdens it with the history of female contraception and the pill, good and bad. The pill was revolutionary and controversial and ultimately empowering, and male contraception shouldn't have to live up to that legacy. Instead, it should simply stand next to female contraception as another option for people who want to prevent pregnancy, a unified front. And when we lead with the word male in male contraception, we automatically start thinking of a division, a split between male and female contraceptive methods. You have your thing, I have mine, and there's no blurring of the lines or a conversation around how these options can work together toward a common goal. 
It doesn't take the collaborative open tone that I think contraception should have. And it brands contraception as separate but equal. And that's not the way I like to think about contraception. Sex is this totally collaborative process, the bringing together of two people. Why can't our contraception go along with that? Our executive director, Heather, who you heard from earlier, she has this really elegant way of putting it. Female contraception was phase one, where we gave products to the people who need them. Women have the health risk of pregnancy, and they need the agency. And phase two is now, where we can bring men into the fold, and where we can make products that have tons of different ways of working, where we can focus on optimization. And side note here, using the terms male and female contraception also adopts an inherently binary view of gender, which totally discounts the non-binary population that still has very real and distinct contraceptive needs. I don't know what we're going to call male contraceptives, and I'm not in marketing or any sort of field that could actually help with this, but I really, really want to make a brand or a nickname or something that could help it stick. And I think that's the biggest challenge of all that's facing male contraception, is framing. We and others are trying to reframe contraception here, to disrupt something that's 60 years old and societally ingrained and somehow still uncouth to talk about in person. We're trying to make contraception different. Make options that are non-hormonal or long-lasting or unisex, and for men. This means a change in mindset. Contraception doesn't have to be a daily pill, and it doesn't have to just be for women. And we can talk about it, openly. We can bring men into the fold now, and get their ideas and their opinions and their participation. And so next week, we're going to do just that. We're going to talk with the guys and get their thoughts on what they want out of contraception and out of their relationships. Next time, Unintended. Special thanks for this episode goes out to Catherine Carpenter, Nika Daria, Bernard Robert, Bethany Youngholt, and Elaine Listener. Music from Blue Dot Sessions. Intended is written and produced by myself and Kevin Shane out of the offices of Male Contraceptive Initiative in Durham, North Carolina. Our executive director is Heather Vidot. I'm Logan Nichols. Intended is a project of Male Contraceptive Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to advancing the development of reversible, non-hormonal contraceptive options for men. For more information or to donate to our cause, visit malecontraceptive.org. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social networks by searching Male Contraceptive. If you like Intended, share us with your friends, leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what we think. Thanks for listening. And now, for something completely different. I can't actually tell if this is recording or not. Check, check. Check. Is this recording? Check, 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 check. It's not recording.